So we are at three o'clock. Uh, we have 47 people who have logged in so far. Should we wait a little bit? Should we get started? I know we have a lot to cover. Um, we do have a lot to cover. Yeah, why don't we go ahead and get started? I'm ready. All right, so I'm, I'm gonna do a quick, very quick introduction. Um, welcome everyone who has joined us, who is joining us. I'm Patricia Medea. I am um, on the board of directors of SNAG and I'm relatively new. Um, I've been sort of assuming the role of, of hosting some of our Road to Success programs, which is a program that's very dear to my heart. Very, I think it's really important. Um, so welcome on behalf of SNAG and um, welcome to our Craft Lab, Craft Lab workshop. Um, I just want to review just a couple of quick uh, 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 Zoom uh, sort of housekeeping and also introduce um, Linda uh, Tian, who will be assisting us today, as well as uh, mm -hmm. Kelly Vanyek Green. Um, we will do our best to moderate the chat and please feel free to ask questions as we go along. We will try to pull out as many questions as we can once we get to the Q&A part and we'll do our best to just support Hillary in every possible way that we can. Um, uh, just remember, everyone who's joining us, please make sure that you keep your microphone muted uh, just to avoid feedback. When we get to the Q&A point, we'll be able to, you know, if, if we, if we want to ask live questions, we'll, we'll ask you to unmute or we can unmute you as well. Uh, but thank you for doing that. That will help us out a lot. Um, again, please use the chat. Uh, it, that, that chat button is, should be usually at the bottom of your screen in the center, right next to the share screen. You can open that. You can type any question you'd like and it will go to everyone and we will respond as needed. Um, your, obviously your, your camera and video are optional. You don't have to keep those on right now. If you choose not to, that's fine, but definitely mute is important. Um, am I forgetting, Linda, am I forgetting anything that I should be? Uh, no, I don't think so. I guess the only other thing I might want to add is that um, if you haven't, if you can see that I am recording uh, today's session, just so you all know that that's happening. Thank you, Linda. Yes. Yeah, no problem. <laughs> that's great. Yeah, we definitely want to share that. So then, um, with that all being said, and without further ado, I'd like to welcome Hillary Holstead Scott uh, to our craft lab, our, our presenter for our craft lab workshop, which is pricing your work. Formulas aren't everything. So, Hillary. It's all yours. <laughs> all right, great. Well, thank you so much. I'm really excited to be here talking about pricing today. I think this is such an important topic for all of us in the jewelry business world. Um, this is definitely the one thing we get the most questions about every year as part of our Halstead grant competition and also just from our clients kind of on a daily ongoing basis. So I recognize what an important and stressful topic this is for all of you running your jewelry Sit businesses. Down. So as we're going ahead and get started, please make sure your microphone is muted. I'm getting some feedback and conversations coming back at us. Um, so take a minute to just make sure your microphone shows mute. And we are going to jump into this really deep topic. So as Patricia mentioned, we're going we're gonna to look at every aspect of pricing today and we're going to talk about formulas, but I also really want to emphasize from the get-go that formulas aren't everything. So let's kind of get started. Um, and I, I get it. I think um, the reason formulas are such a big part of the conversation in pricing is because it kind of feels legitimate, right? And we all want to feel like professionals and feel like we're pricing in the right way. And I think looking at the list of people signed up for this webinar, um, it was really interesting because I saw such a mix of new jewelry designers, experienced jewelry designers, and even master jewelry artists. So I think that just shows how much angst there is in pricing decisions, right? Um, we all want to feel professional and yet we all feel like we're missing something all the time. And that's frustrating. Um, so let's really explore how to price with confidence today. 
how to really understand everything that goes into it and feel good about the decisions you're making to price your collection. So that's our biggest goal, right? But I also want to kind of change your mindset on a couple of aspects of pricing decisions today. So the first thing is to understand all of your cost inputs at a new level. We're going to explore all of the terminology that you may not be totally comfortable with and make, you, make sure you understand all the multiple facets of pricing. And then the second thing I want to do is really emphasize that your pricing decision is not so much about coming up with that magic number, that right answer. It's really about getting to you to the point of earning a living. At the end of the day, that's the biggest goal. It's not the number on the price tag. It's making sure that you're pricing your collection in a way that keeps your business sustainable, keeps you earning income and doing well for yourself and for your family. So that's really a starting point we're gonna dive into in the second half of the presentation. Um, but before I get too much further, I wanna say a big thank you to Snag for allowing me to um, you know, join in on this webinar, this craft lab. I'm really excited to be here with all of you. Um, big thanks to Patricia for that introduction, all of her hard work on this, and Linda as well. We're so grateful to Indiana State University for hosting this webinar through their Zoom platform. As Patricia mentioned earlier, Kelly from Halstead is gonna be moderating our comments. And if you see me looking to the right quite a bit, it's because I have a second screen over here with comments and video and my other files. Um, so I can't really be reading all those comments while I'm talking. So Kelly's gonna be our moderator. She's gonna try and help you with any technical issues and kind of keep track of the questions that we're hearing regularly. So we can start kicking those around during the presentation and definitely at the end during the Q&A session. Um, I also want to say a big thank you to all of our past Halstead Grant winners and finalists. You're going to be seeing images from them throughout this presentation, so you have a lot of beautiful visuals to go through all of this nitty gritty content. Um, it keeps the slides a lot easier to digest and, and more enjoyable, so thanks to all of you. All right, so let's keep going if I can find my mouse here. All right, what you're going to need today um, for the next two hours, this is going to be an interactive workshop. So take a few minutes right now to kind of get yourself in a place where you've got a little workspace. Um, definitely have some scratch paper or a notepad. Um, I really encourage you to be on a desktop computer if that's possible. If you're on a cell phone or a tablet, um, this is going to be a little bit more tricky, um, especially when we get to the interactive um, spreadsheet tools later on. Now that's not required, you can definitely just watch those sections and come back to the attachment tools later. So if you have trouble accessing them, don't worry, you're still gonna get a lot of value today. Um, but it is ideal if you can be on a desktop computer where you have your mouse and keyboard. Um, I'd encourage you to either physically get out three items from your jewelry collection or mentally kind of start preparing right now and thinking about three items um, that you make to sell, right? Um, so try and make those pretty representative of a range in your line, uh, maybe a pair of earrings, a ring, and a necklace, uh, maybe items that represent a range of price points, um, labor, and complexity in your collection. So you have a few different examples prepared as we go through some of the samples um, and interactive portions ahead. We're definitely going to use a lot of numbers today, but I don't want that to scare anybody off. I'm going to walk you all through this. Um, so I don't want you to feel intimidated in any way. Um, you don't need any advanced knowledge to be attending this webinar. Um, we're gonna start with the basics and we're gonna build from there. Um, we are scheduled for two hours and I think by the time we get through Q&A, we will definitely use all of that time. Um, but as Patricia and Linda mentioned, we're recording this. So if you do need to bow out early, no worries. You can always come back and catch the rest of it in the recordings later. All right. So another um, preparation step, later on in the presentation, we're gonna get to our interactive tool um, that we use at Halstead as part of the business development um, preparation tools for our Halstead grant applicants. Um, we also have this available through our blog articles. And right here, um, you can actually click on the slide you're seeing on your screen right now, right where you see my mouse. Um, and that's gonna take you to the Google Docs page where it's gonna ask you if you wanna download a copy of the interactive tool. Um, so go ahead and give that a try. If you're having trouble accessing that tool for any reason, um, go ahead and pop a note in comments. Kelly's gonna help you guys troubleshoot this 
you know, for the next half hour of the presentation so we can get as many people logged into that tool as possible. Um, once you do have it on your screen, just kind of set it aside. We're going to come back to it later. We're all going to work on it together. So don't feel like you need to be jumping in right away while I'm talking. Um, but I just want to make sure you have some time in case you have any issues. Um, that is a, a publicly accessible link um, and spreadsheet. So I think everybody should be all set. Um, but Kelly's definitely here to assist if you've got issues and she can also send it to you as an attachment. So we will, we will get that going kind of in the background as we move along. Thanks Kelly for posting that link. All right. Great. And I think a lot of things, you know, it depends sometimes on your browser or what kind of device you're on. So thanks for your patience and for bearing with us, everybody. We appreciate that. All right. So we're going to start out with something interactive right off the bat. Um, and we're going to play a little game of The Price is Right. So if you're my age or older, you definitely remember The Price is Right on TV. Um, and that was a fun game show where you guessed the correct price of an item, right? So I want everyone to kind of participate in this in the comments. Um, we have a bracelet here that our studio coordinator, Erica, made a while back. Um, and I want you to, to post in the comments real quick, just what would you pay for this bracelet if you were gonna buy it at retail? What do you think a fair price is? Go ahead and tell us what you think. Um, it's, this is like a half inch sterling silver cuff bracelet. It was made from 18 gauge sheet. Um, it's sweat soldered with moon phases. This is a pretty simple, basic piece of jewelry. But these are components we can all kind of wrap our head around. I think we're all familiar with the materials here. Oh, I love this. I'm seeing lots of numbers coming over here on the comments feed. This is awesome. But really, like, go with your gut. What would you pay? Not what's the right price, but what would you pay? What do you think it's worth? Um, what's it worth to you? And that's an important question. Because I think one of the, one of the real hangups we all have with price is that we're always trying to come up with that, that right answer, that one number, and it's, it's really different for everybody. And I think that's part of the fun of this exercise. So I see a lot of numbers coming through. Um, Kelly, I know, is watching all of those results. Um, so go ahead and unmute Kelly. Tell us, what are you seeing? Like, what's the high and the low end of the spectrum? Um, so I think on the low, we got a 45. And on the high, we went up as high as, um, I think I saw 165 in there. Um, okay. I don't know if this will affect any of your guesses, but it is a all sterling silver um, cup. But I That's guess great. Just, were, was oh. there any number you were seeing most often? Is there kind of an average? I think an average is probably 80 to to $100. Okay. That's great. Um, we, yeah. <laughs> yeah. lowest, lowest 35, highest 165. All right, that's fantastic. And what I love about this is I think you're always going to see that range, right? So for one person, this is worth $45. For one person, this is worth $200. And that just shows how complex pricing is and how much latitude you have in a lot of this decision making, right? So I think this is a really fun exercise in determining value and understanding that value is different for every buyer. And it's also different for every target audience. So if you think about your particular jewelry collection and the target audience that you're trying to reach, that's a specific group of people. And you're still gonna see a range in that group, but depending on the work you make and the people you're selling to, you're kind of looking for an intersection of value, right? Um, and that's what's so interesting about pricing when you step back from it. So it's really interesting when we, when we think of price as consumers, right? We walk into the grocery store, we buy a can of soup and it is $1.39, right? You never even question that for a second. That's the price, it's $1.39. You don't think to yourself, I wonder what that chicken broth cost and what the labor component was to get that soup into the can. But that's exactly what we do as jewelers, right? We really, we really sweat the details. Um, and don't get me wrong, those details matter. We're gonna talk about them quite a bit. But I also want you to, to remember the flip side of it, that as a consumer, a price is a given and we don't approach most transactions um, looking to negotiate. So, you know, you can set a price that you think your work is worth and that your customer is willing to pay and then stand by that and feel good about it, okay? Um, so remember that, that opposite perspective. 
So I want to kind of roll in this really cool project by Sarah Rachel Brown. A lot of you may know Sarah. She's the host of the podcast Perceived Value, and she does this very cool interactive exhibit called Val Value Optimized Pricing. Um, if you haven't checked this out, you can pull up records of this project on Instagram with the hashtag Value Optimized Pricing, all one word. Um, and this is such a cool concept because Sarah's not only a podcast host, she's a jewelry artist and a metalsmith. Um, and this is what she's done. Um, she made this very particular necklace. So check it out here. And we can play this little game again if you want to do it in the comments. Um, she, makes this, she made this necklace. It's a pretty chunky sterling silver necklace. The coloring on this photo is a little hard to see, but these are sterling kind of claw mountings. And then there's acrylic stones here in the center. And part of this project is that she displays the necklace and she asks everyone who attends the exhibit to fill out one of these slips of paper and say their occupation, what they would pay for this necklace, and how much metal smithing experience they have. And I'm really grateful to Sarah for allowing me to share this exhibit because I think it's another great example of this strange perspective we all have on pricing, right? So go ahead, keep you know making your comments. This is a very different necklace than the cuff we showed before. If you wanna take a stab at this on how you would value this necklace, what's your perceived value and what would you pay? Now talking to Sarah about this project, it's such an interesting exhibition um, because she has really expressed how vulnerable it made it made her feel to not just set a price but to ask what people wanted to pay um, and kind of start a conversation about value and perceived value of one object across many different people and that's that's a really fascinating exercise to do in the public space um, so sarah's done this quite a bit um, with kind of student and metalsmithing audiences and also with the general public i know she's done this several times now um, and it's, it's fascinating. So I love that I'm seeing a lot of guesses. For all of you looking at the comments, again, you can see this huge range and what perceived value is on this piece. And here's some of the answers that she got. And these responses become part of her exhibition, which I think really adds a new perspective to the whole project, right? So here we see this big range, right? A student amateur would pay $7 for this. You know, all of us as jewelers, we know there's way more than $7 just in the silver right there, right? So of course that seems crazy to us, but on the flip side, we also have a person saying $200,000. That's also probably a little outside the, the realm of possibilities, right? And then you're gonna have this huge middle range that we're seeing here and in the comments, anything from $300 up to $700 right there in the middle. Um, so again, Perceived value is not one number. It's a lot of different numbers for a lot of different people. But which one is right? And which one should you go with? And which number do you put on the price tag? That's what we're here to figure out today. So as I mentioned before, what we're looking for is really that sweet spot, right? It's the intersection of a price you are willing to accept to earn a living, and the price customers are willing to pay, the value they place on the work you're making. And it's pretty, pretty tricky, right, to know exactly where their spot's going to be. And as I mentioned earlier, I think we all second guess that. You, you're really stressed about um, either selling yourself short or um, trying to ask too much. And I think there's kind of this morality question built into the pricing debate that adds pressure to the whole decision, right? We don't wanna feel like we're taking advantage of other people and we don't wanna feel like they're taking advantage of us either. And that's all kind of baked in to pricing strategy, unfortunately. Um, so the more you explore the mechanics of pricing and get comfortable with it, I think the more confidence you build in earning your living, in assigning a value to your work and knowing that you're asking a fair price. Um, and that's, that's what I hope you can leave with today. All right, so now that you've got your scrap paper out and your pen and everything ready, um, the first thing I want you to write down on your notes today is your magic number. I want you to set a realistic salary goal for where you live and your stage in your career. What are you looking to earn on an annual basis through your jewelry work? Um, and I think this is a really important concept with pricing. A lot of people think this is a separate concept, but um, for me, I think your salary 
your annual take home pay should be a very big part of your decision making when you're pricing your work. Um, and we're going to continue exploring this throughout the workshop today. So this isn't something like super aspirational. I want to make a million dollars and retire when I'm 45. Um, this is your realistic earning a living salary. Um, and I think we all have this in our heads, right? Like what we're making now, where we feel like we, we need to be or we want to be. Um, so write that down, big old Sharpie marker and circle it. We're going to keep coming back to it. Because at the end of the day, the big picture is that your pricing is all about your income, right? Again, it's not the number on the price tag. It's earning a living um, at the end of the year, paying all your bills um, and providing for your family. So the way the rest of the presentation is gonna go, this workshop, we're gonna break down all of the pricing lingo and components next. And then we're gonna get to that worksheet that you downloaded and we're gonna work backwards from the salary number that you just put at the top of your notes. All right, great. Kelly, thank you for helping people out with attachments. <laughs> She's scrambling over there. I can see her emailing frantically. <laughs> okay, so the big hint of the day, coming back to that soup can example, is people really don't care about your formula. It is a great tool. It's a good starting point, so it's worth spending some time on, but I just don't want you putting too much stock in that answer that you get. This isn't math class, right? Um, we're looking at this as a strategy, um, but it's a great starting point. Um, and there are several different formulas out there. So I'm going with one example. I know there are others, um, and you can definitely debate the merits of each one, um, but they all generally have the same components. So that's what we're gonna start with. Um, so we're all working from the same information and we're all on the same page. So this is a good time to get out one of your sample items, either physically or mentally, have a piece in mind that you're thinking of as we move through this. Um, don't sweat the math too much, but I think it really helps to have a concrete example in front of you um, so that you're not thinking about these things abstractly. You're using a real sample from your work. Um, so this is typically what a pricing formula looks like. We're going to see things like materials and labor. We're going to see your overhead costs and some kind of markup that get you to a wholesale price and then an additional markup that gets you to a retail price. But there's a lot of vocabulary tangled up in all of these pricing equations. So I want to move through those so that we're all um, really clearly understanding what we're talking about here. So at the top of this formula, let me get out my little pointer here. Um, materials and labor are also called your variable costs. Um, that's an accounting term, but what it's really, really referring to is the specific inputs to one piece of jewelry or to each piece of jewelry as you scale up and produce more, right? So um, just looking at this piece at the left, right? We have a, a round circle blank. We have an ornament soldered on top of it. Um, those were the materials in this piece and then the time to make it. Those are your variable costs. Um, the only additional things would probably be like your consumables and your packaging um, because those costs change with the number of pieces you make. By contrast, we have our fixed costs which are also called overhead. So it's roughly the same term, right? Overhead, fixed costs, they mean the same thing. These are your expenses that don't change depending on the number of items you make, um, the number of items you manufacture, the number of items you sell, whatever we're, we're talking about. So that's all your other business expenses. And there's a lot of those. Um, you know, your rent, your utilities, your marketing, your admin time, all that stuff. Those are your fixed overhead costs. When we look at a multiplier, that's what we call your markup, right? You're taking your fixed costs, you're multiplying it by 1.25, 1.5, 2, 3, you know, whatever your, your formula or your model says, and that's going to get you to your wholesale point. Now, typically, if you want to sell wholesale, you're going to need to leave some room between your wholesale price and your retail price so that your resellers have an opportunity to make money for their business and earn their living as well. So one of the things I want to emphasize is that this is a really critical gap. Um, and a lot of jewelers that we talk to may make the strategic decision that most of the selling they want to do is straight to the consumer. They really want to sell primarily retail and not worry about wholesale relationships. Um, that is a totally justifiable strategic decision that you can make. Um, but if you make it, I really encourage you to still leave this wholesale price gap. And the reason for that is that your strategy changes. And I've talked to a lot of mid-career and late-career artists who initially took a retail-focused strategy for their business, 
and many years later decided to try wholesale sales, but they hadn't left in that wholesale markup gap for resellers. And once your work is out there at a certain price point and you're trying to sell it wholesale, you find yourself kind of painted into an, a corner and you've got to really work hard to dig out of that. So it's important to make sure you have your wholesale retail markup gap regardless of your strategy. So keep that in mind. But one other thing I want to point out is, as we've had this discussion so far about formulas, doesn't this all feel a little bit arbitrary to you? I mean, you know, whether you choose 1.5 or 2.5 as your markup, again, is your customer, is your customer going to question that? Or are they going to know that? Um, can you imagine someone coming into your booth and looking at your price tag and saying, I don't think you used a 1.5 markup over your materials on this price. It would never happen. So, you know, again, this is a tool, it's a starting point, but don't get too married to the outcome from these formulas. You have a lot of wiggle room and a lot of things to consider here. So let's look at materials. And these are one of the variable costs that we mentioned. So your materials are your metals, any findings, chain, or components in your piece, consumables that are used up um, during fabrication or bench time, like your solder, your sandpaper, your chemicals, and then the packaging that you use to sell this piece of jewelry, right? The gift box, bags, stickers, ribbons, anything like that. Those are all variable costs that are associated with your materials. One of the things I want you to really think about um, if you're looking at selling jewelry professionally, especially if you're new to the field, is consider materials. Um, and one of the things we see a lot with um, emerging jewelry artists is that if you start out working in base metals in copper and brass, for example, you know, the markup um, is very different on copper and brass compared to gold, right? So if we're using that same formula, that two times markup on materials and labor, um, and you're working with copper and you have, you know, $1.60 worth of materials <laughs> in your piece, um, you're going to come up with these ridiculous prices, right? Um, so materials do matter in this. And it's another reason that, you know, these formulas, they're a tool, they're not the be all end all. Um, so the, you know, the formula you used for a copper piece would be very different than a gold piece, for example. Um, and then everything in between, there's also other factors that we're going to get to. Um, but this is something to consider as you um, look at that relationship between the price of your collection and earning a living as well. And one of the things that is really hard for new jewelry artists working primarily in base metal is it often is really hard to get to those numbers where you're earning a sustainable salary um, when you're using formulas and using these straight up markups off of um, pieces that have very low material intrinsic input costs. Um, and that becomes problematic. So those are things to think about. And when we get to kind of the salary tool and looking at all of these variables as um, relationships in a system, I think you're going to see that a lot more clearly. Okay, so an example I really like to give when we talk about pricing is blue jeans, because just like we were talking about suit before, blue jeans are a great way of gaining perspective in this entire conversation. So you may or may not know this, but the cost of denim is somewhere between two and five dollars a yard. Now, if you're buying denim commercially, it's even less than that. So I want you to think about that two to five dollars a yard for denim, and then I want to think want you to think about the price you paid for jeans last time. Yikes. It's a little bit scary, right? I mean, maybe low end $30, high end what? I don't even know, $150 for a pair of blue jeans now? It gets pretty crazy. Um, and yet we don't even question it, right? We don't question the morality of the pricing of blue jeans. Um, but again, as jewelers, um, we feel like we're doing something wrong sometimes. You know, we feel like we're pricing too high. Um, but in the same way, I wouldn't say that those blue jeans manufacturers are doing anything immoral either. There are a lot of business costs to consider. Um, marketing is an enormous business cost for an international brand, for example. Um, the different inputs really come to bear on this. Uh, marketing, branding, administration time, staffing time, logistics, all of these things get built in. And that's true even on a small scale for entrepreneurs. Um, so whenever you feel yourself kind of getting into that, that panic mode of I'm priced too high and that's why um, you know, this isn't working, um, you know, just, just remember blue jeans. 
<laughs> um, it's all about delivering value. And at the end of the day, customers place a lot of value on blue jeans, right? We wear them all the time. Um, comfort is a big factor. Style is a big factor. Those things are true for jewelry buyers as well. It's about delivering value in that transactional relationship. Um, and it's much less about the magic number once again. All right, so the next component of our variable costs when we move on from materials is labor. Um, and what do you use for labor? I know sometimes that can be a little bit tough to tackle too. So let's, let's think of a few different aspects on the labor component. It's a variable cost and time is money. And I think one of the things to consider when you're starting to make jewelry um, as a career um, and it's, it's becoming the way you earn your living, this becomes a much bigger part of the conversation. So a lot of times when we talk to um, new metalsmithing graduates um, and technical expertise is so important, so please don't think I'm minimizing that, um, but part of that technical education is often making every single ounce of a piece, right? You make everything from the clasps to the jump rings, um, the attachment points, the cold connections, and it is critical to learn all of those skills. But as you start to do this for a career, um, some of that hand crafting comes at a cost and that cost is time. Um, so at a certain point, if you're making more and more work, especially if you're doing production lines, um, the trade-offs become very different. And it may make a lot more sense to buy your jump rings instead of making your jump rings because you need to save time. Um, and especially early in um, a jeweler's career, we find that people often minimize the value of time and then minimize the, the value of labor. Um, so if you're spending, you know, a three hour portion of every week making jump rings for the week, you know, there are other ways you can use that time that may actually earn your business more money. If you're using that for design prototyping or production or um, marketing, you know, a lot of those things are going to deliver way more value for your business than the material savings you may gain from hand making your jump rings, just as an example. So really consider all of your labor inputs um, when you get to the pricing and reselling your work stage in your career. Um, now, if you're doing a piece for display or artistic purposes, that may be a completely different conversation. Um, but when you're trying to price competitively and deliver that value to your customer, um, these are some of the things to, to consider. Um, a lot of the comments we hear at shows and when you're um, selling direct retail over the counter are related to labor costs, right? So these are all the things we find most annoying in the jewelry fields. These comments that, oh, I could make that or is that, you know, $5 worth of stuff in that and you're charging me, you know, 75? Um, it's very off-putting, right? Um, and I think this is some of the stuff we kind of hear um, in the back of our minds when we're really anxious about pricing. Um, these are the comments you really remember. Um, and I think one of the things that's, that's critical here is if your earrings were priced at $100 or your earrings were priced at $90, <laughs> you are probably still gonna get these comments from those people anyways. Um, so again, this is not a question of, you know, um, really getting that number um, pricing exactly right, a little higher, a little bit lower. These people were probably not going to see the value in your work anyways. So don't try and please them is kind of the big takeaway there. Um, this probably isn't your target buyer if they're making comments like this. So they should not be directing your, your pricing strategy. Um, so try and keep that in your mind and silence these little voices in your head. Just don't listen to them. <laughs> so what does go into your labor time? There are a few different parts um, to the labor that go into a, a one piece of jewelry, for example. You've got your design time, your um, conceptual time, and then you have your actual production time, right? And here we get into a really interesting issue in jewelry businesses in terms of what is the mix of one of a kind pieces in your collection and what is the mix of production pieces in your collection. And that kind of changes this conversation, right? So if every piece in your collection is one of a kind, you should definitely be considering your design and prototyping time as one of your variable costs, right? Because every piece is one of a kind, all of the time you spend sketching, narrowing down your sketches, coming up with ideas is part of that one piece. Um, now, if you're doing production line work, 
Um, you probably spend, um, you know, a certain amount of time working on designing a collection and then you move into production phase. Um, and in that case, you know, your design time might be more of like an overhead, almost an administrative component of your business. Um, and, you know, both of those strategies have their pluses and minuses. It very much depends on the specific work you're creating. So I'm not saying one is better than the other. Um, but just keep in mind that that matters. And again, just like we talked about uh, markup on a copper piece of jewelry versus markup on a gold piece of jewelry, it also looks very different when you're talking about one of a kind work um, that's very complex um, and you know technically sophisticated compared to production work um, that may be much more basic um, and a different type of jewelry altogether. Um, so just remember you have a lot of latitude in those numbers. All right, so when we're looking at design and production time, it's also hard to assign a value. And uh, um, a lot of times I think we undercount um, our labor value when you look at kind of pricing that into your work. So I think a really good way to gain perspective on that question is not what would you pay yourself because it's difficult to answer that, um, but what would you pay a studio assistant if you needed to hire someone to help you make this work? And I think that takes it out of the personal realm and allows you to look at it a little bit more objectively. Um, so one of the tools that we use um, quite a bit at Halstead, oops, next slide here, um, is some of the salary benchmarking you can find on the internet. So if you were hiring for a new position, you can get on Google um, and this one particular website I find especially valuable, it's called payscale.com. Um, but you can just enter a Google search term and say payscale.com, or pardon me, payscale, and then a job title, such as jewelry production assistant. So payscale jewelry production assistant, pay or salary, um, and that'll take you to a page that will give you the average salary nationally for any job title you can think of. It's an amazing resource. Um, now, this is the result you get if you do that at a national level, but once you get onto the page, you can actually fine tune that regionally by state or by major city. And that'll tell you kind of what average jewelry production assistant rates are geographically. And it'll give you a decent idea of what you would need to pay someone to do some basic studio assistance work. Okay, now that would need to be kind of your minimum labor rate for production time, right? Um, because if you needed help, that's what you'd have to pay. So you should be paying yourself at least that. Um, now, if you have a lot of technical expertise, are doing more sophisticated work, obviously I would argue that rate should be quite a bit higher because it would be difficult to find an employee who could assist you with that. And you would need a higher skilled person um, working in your studio. So if we look again, um, back to the slide, um, time to produce a piece of jewelry, um, times the hourly wage to get your labor cost component. Um, if, an, if an item is taking you two hours and you were paying an assistant $15 an hour, you're looking at a minimum labor component of $30. Um, so again, take that to an objective place um, and don't minimize your, your labor value. All right, so, so far we've really focused up here on the variable costs, on all the things to think about with your materials um, and your labor. Uh, now we want to move into kind of the overhead and fixed cost portion of these pricing formulas and your cost inputs. So your overhead or your fixed costs are pretty much all your other business expenses, right? So that means your office supplies, everything from like your computer and toner, um, your marketing and advertising, the benefits you pay to yourself um, for, for health insurance, your website and software subscription fees, travel time and expense, all of your administration time spent answering emails, um, figuring out strategic questions, doing research. Um, I think we already mentioned rent, tools, um, fees to accountants and professional services. All of these other things go into your overhead costs. And this is a pretty big list. Um, one of the common mistakes we see with a lot of jewelers as they move from maybe a hobby phase into a professional phase is, is letting a lot of this overhead cost kind of drop out of consideration. Especially when you start out working in your home, you know, you're using the computer you always had, maybe as a student or for your other job. 
you don't really consider those as business overhead costs until it comes time to replace them, right? You have to buy a new computer or you have to move out of you know, your second bedroom and into rented studio space. And then all of a sudden those feel like new expenses. Uh, most likely they were there all along, but um, you just weren't thinking about them in that way. So it's important to kind of allocate um, some of these expenses over to your jewelry business and part of your overhead consideration um, just so that you're pricing them into your work and making sure that you're covered for the growth of your business as you develop. All right, so we are going to move over to that pricing worksheet. Um, there's another link here. Um, Kelly, how are we doing? Are most people okay? Can you give me a thumbs up? We have a fair number of people on there. Okay, good. Um, I, have, I have one question. Yeah. Um, someone said, should students consider their education expenses as well? Oh, that's an interesting question. Um, I think you could probably debate that, but I would say no. I mean, your student loan, I understand like you probably have your student loan payments on a schedule and that needs to become part of the salary you need to earn. Um, but pricing it into your work, I think, is pretty tricky, right? Um, I think consider it as part of, you know, your salary goal. What do you need to earn to cover all of your household expenses, including any debt payments such as student debt, um, a mortgage, a car payment? You know, it's along with those sorts of things. Um, but I, similarly, even though you may be taking your car to trade shows, um, I don't know that I would necessarily price your car payments into your work directly, right? it becomes kind of part of the household expense instead. That's great, Kelly. Did you get any other questions we should address now before we kind of move to the next phase? Nope, okay, great. If you are having trouble getting into the worksheet, don't worry, you can follow along. Um, there's still a lot to be gained from kind of um, being a spectator in this, this next section. Um, and then you can always come back into this worksheet um, later. Let me drag this over here. And I'm hoping I don't close out of anything I shouldn't. <laughs> All right, so once you kind of make your copy, Google, Google prompts you to make a copy of the worksheet, um, open it up. This should be what you see. Um, this is the first page. Um, and I know not everybody has a lot of experience with spreadsheets. If you don't, don't worry. We're going to keep this really simple. Um, this front tab is just kind of instructions that I'm going to be walking you through this. You are welcome to just watch what I'm doing on the screen, or if you are able to on your PC at home, you can also be kind of working on your own copy off to the side using the sample jewelry pieces that you um, have in your mind or in front of you on the desk. Um, and we'll kind of go through some of these variables. So this front tab, if you look at the bottom here, this is a tab and we're on the instructions tab. We're gonna click over to the salary calculator tab next. So go ahead and click on that at the bottom. And the way this works is that blue cells are input cells um, that we want you to kind of play with. And you're gonna see results in the gray subcategory sections and the yellow. So we're gonna do this together and you're, you'll get a better idea of how it works. Um, this is set up to start with your salary. And that's why it was so important that we have that number in mind right from the beginning, because I really think that's the foundation of pricing your work. So, um, we have your salary number in mind, right? Okay, now let's see how this kind of relates um, to production time and admin time. So we talked about this as part of kind of the various cost inputs for your work, right? All right, so production salary calculation. This is the time you use to actually make work. Um, now, don't let the word production fool you, whether you're making one of a kind work or production line work, this is still bench time. Um, maybe that would be a better phrase. This is your studio time, your bench time, actual making time. Um, so we just talked about, you know, the national average for an entry level studio assistant would be $15 an hour. Obviously, that's, that's an average. So there's a big range around that. Um, so how would you value production time for yourself? Let's start with $20 just um, for the sake of argument. And then think about how much time in a typical work week you're spending making work. So none of the other tasks, just making. Now, if you're new to the fields, I suspect most of your time is making and much less of your time is administrative work. 
If you're mid or late career, you're gonna see that balance shift. And as you maybe hire an assistant or several assistants um, in your jewelry business, you'll see this shift to where you're making work for far fewer hours and you're spending a lot more time on administration, prototyping and design. Um, but let's just start with this for now. So let's say about 30 hours a week, you're at the bench and you're working 50, 50 weeks a year. Okay, so those are the first few lines of this worksheet. Um, $20 an hour for bench time, 30 hours a week at the bench, 50 weeks a year working. Okay, if we run out that math and this does it for you, that's $2,400 a week in production salary and $30,000 a year, okay? Now we can play with this and see what a difference it makes when you change the wage. So if we bring that wage down to $15, that brings the annual production salary portion down to 22,000 a year. It's a big jump, all right? So let's look at our admin time and then see how this works together even more. So your administration time would be everything else, right? Um, if you're doing um, production work, certainly your design and prototyping time, managing your business, all of that service and shipping, um, marketing, traveling, all those other things are your admin time. So, Typically, again, we would want to look at this using payscale.com or another objective tool. What would you need to pay someone if you hired them to do all those things? That's tricky, I gotcha. <laughs> um, but generally speaking, this is a more experienced person that can handle all of this stuff. Um, and so, you know, typically the admin time is paid a little bit higher when you're running the business and hiring studio assistants. Um, so for argument's sake, again, we threw on 25 for now and 10 hours a week for admin time, same number of weeks per year. Um, and that gives you the admin component here by month and by year, okay? Now, when we come down to the bottom, it's totaling those two components, your bench time and your admin time. So between the two, we're at a 40 hour full-time work week. Monthly, that's $2,800. And right now, annually, that's $35,000, right? So a lot of times this becomes really instrumental in seeing if you're getting to that target number and valuing your time the way you need to, to make a living, right? So sometimes we see this and you're like, oh my gosh, okay, maybe, maybe for my area, if I live in New York, there's no way, that's not gonna work. So maybe I need to be pricing in a higher wage for my production time and or my admin time to make sure I'm reaching my goals to earn a living. So if we go back to 20, we see that makes a really big difference, right? Just the way you're valuing your labor time at the bench, 20 was um, down at the bottom of uh, an annual salary of 42,000. If we bring that down to 15, it drops it down to $35,000 a year. That's a really big change. So I know it's tough when you're kind of pricing these things into your work. Sometimes you, you take a stab at a number because it feels right in the moment, but I think it's important to kind of see how that flows through um, to, the, to the living you can earn from your work, right? And then maybe reconsider some of those input costs and what you need to be doing. Now on a similar note, hours per week can make a really big difference, right? Um, if you're only able to work 30 hours a week, for example, those things um, bring your, your total productive time down quite a bit, okay? Now this is tricky because we've suddenly, we've moved from, oh, I think you gotta turn off your, turn on your mic, Kelly. Okay, sorry, I didn't wanna know. Yeah. Um, I, think it, I think you said it was based off of kind of where you live, but there's a question, how did you work out the admin time hourly wage of 25? So again, using payscale.com, I think this is tricky because this encompasses a lot of different hats. And that's what's really hard um, in entrepreneurship is you end up wearing so many different hats, right? So one minute you're the janitor, <laughs> which is a very different wage from being um, the business owner and creating your annual show schedule and your strategic plan and buying all of your materials and inputs, right? So you have this tremendous range of very complex and sophisticated tasks and very basic tasks. Um, and that tipping point in that wage is really difficult to identify. Um, so I think it's best, you know, experiment with those tools like using Google and payscale.com to put in a few different job descriptions that are part of this, right? So maybe put in um, marketing manager for one, 
you spend a lot of your time marketing if you're if you're selling your jewelry work. Um, you're using social media, you're creating strategic plans, you're photographing your work and putting together visual presentations. Um, that's strategic marketing work. So what does the marketing manager wage look like? On the flip side, um, you know, what does a logistics coordinator wage look like? What does um, shipping and warehousing work look like? There's so many different factors. So you can definitely debate that number too. This is not, again, there is no one right number. There is no one right answer. Um, and a lot of this too is going to depend on the stage in your career, right? So if you're an early career person, just kind of learning the ropes in your business and you don't have a lot of experience, um, it's probably fair to assign yourself a lower admin wage than someone who is a mature jewelry artist and very accomplished and with an established reputation in the field already. Um, in that case, I would say that wage is extremely low. So it just depends on your experience um, and your skill set. But one of the cool things about this tool, what I really encourage you to do is play with that number a lot. So the whole idea here is to see how small changes to any of your inputs really affect your outcomes, right? So let's do that a little bit right now. Let me make sure we're back up to a full-time schedule. Um, so let's change the balance a little bit more here, like we talked about. As you progress through your career, you're probably gonna spend more time on design tasks and administrative tasks and maybe a little less time doing production work. Um, so let's, let's move our hours over to more admin time. And let's say, you know, we're quite a bit more experienced and that admin wage comes up quite a bit and your production time wage should come up quite a bit. Um, and then you're seeing major changes in the salary at the end of the day, right? So one of the cool things here is just to play with this and see how it changes the numbers at the bottom in yellow, right? See how you can get to your goals. Again, you've got that goal number in mind and we need to balance that goal number with what's realistic, right? What you can deliver on um, in value to your customers and how you're spending your time, okay? So salary is part of this entire process. I just wanna make sure you're including it and in how you think about pricing your work. So I encourage you to kind of come in here, see how these variable changes affect the salary. See what you think is realistic for your experience level and the tasks you're doing and where you need to be. Now this becomes really important because if you think back to those pricing formulas, we had our labor time as a major variable cost component and we had our overhead and our admin time as a major cost component, right? And I think a lot of times when using those formulas, again, we just take a stab at a number we heard someone say a few weeks ago, oh yeah, you should use $17 an hour for your production time. Well, you know, yes, maybe no, but how does that affect the way you earn your living? Um, and that's what I want you to really be thinking about with this tool. Okay, so this is part of the process, but it's not the whole process. Let's move on to the next tab and get back into pricing a piece of jewelry. So down at the bottom, we're on the salary calculator tab. Let's move over to the pricing worksheet tab now that we have inputs here. Um, let's kind of put this um, back at kind of a, an entry level, an early career um, new jewelry business. You'd probably be looking at you know, numbers closer to this. Again, not the right answers, but somewhere in this range. Um, and we can you know, vary the details. You can use um, partial dollars too, that's fine. It doesn't have to be even amounts. Um, okay, so let's leave those inputs in place and move on over to our pricing worksheet. And once again, I want you to have um, one or more of your jewelry pieces in front of you on your desk or in mind at the very least, because you're gonna need those as we move through. Um, so this is broken up into a couple of sections. We have our overhead section at the top, this first block. And then down below, we have our variable cost section. And now you guys all are pros. You know what all of these terms mean. You got the lingo. Um, so you've got a really solid foundation. So overhead, um, you could add lines in here. If this does not cover all of your overhead, you can enter zeros. If these items um, don't apply to you, that's up to you. Um, but these are things you should really be considering as part of your overhead costs, right? Your rent, your utilities, 
As part of your utilities in this day and age, I consider your cell phone contract to be a major part of that. Keep that in mind. That is definitely a business tool. Um, your tools and equipment maintenance, office supplies, marketing and advertising, um, your benefits, your monthly benefits payments, and any fees if you're using outsourced um, plating, stone setting, casting, um, any work like that, definitely consider those kinds of things. Um, some of that actually can come down into your variable costs if it's for specific work. And actually what would be more appropriate up here is probably more like fees to your, your webmaster and your accountant, um, things like that. And you may need to average those kind of across a month to come up with input numbers here. This is set up to be monthly. Okay, so you can be playing with your own inputs. Um, you may not be spending a lot on marketing right now, that's okay. Um, but again, the value in this tool is seeing how the different input changes affect the bottom line. So we'll get to that as we move on down. All right, this middle section is volume, and this is one that kind of makes everybody's head spin. <laughs> but this is, this is part of what we need to be thinking about too, right? So how many pieces of jewelry are you selling in a month? Now, obviously this is tricky because you've got earrings priced um, maybe very low and your statement pieces priced very high. Um, so again, this is ballpark. This is just to kind of understand how everything works together. Um, so as an example, let's say you sell a hundred pieces of jewelry in a month. Okay. That kind of divides out all of your overhead expenses into an overhead add on. Right. So if we use these inputs for overhead and we sell roughly a hundred items a month, we should be adding approximately 36 dollars to each piece of jewelry as our overhead cost. Does that make sense? You guys following me? So again, if we play with these inputs, we see how it changes. Okay, maybe I just moved into a new studio and it is really expensive and that makes your overhead add-on go up. It should go up because you have higher input costs. Okay, maybe for a while I'm using the extra second bedroom instead of running it out to a roommate, okay? So maybe that brings your input costs down and your overhead comes down to $33 a piece. Now similarly, your capacity and your volume matters a lot too. And this is often one of the biggest barriers for early career jewelry artists because you aren't selling much yet, right? So maybe you're really struggling to sell 10 pieces a month. And holy cow, that brings your overhead add-on to $300 a month. That's ridiculous, right? I mean, pardon me, $300 a piece. Um, obviously that's not gonna fly. Um, so that tells you there's something to address, right? Okay, I either need to sell more pieces of jewelry or I need to bring down my overhead costs. Does that make sense? So again, the tool is to kind of help you understand how these different things work together. Are we getting sure. questions, Kelly? Yeah, we got some questions. Um, I think you kind of answered Christine's. Um, she said, should the number, um, the maximum number of pieces they can realistically make or how many we are currently selling um, for that number mm -hmm. uh, of how many items to sell monthly. Um, and then Carol asked if we have a percent embedded for overhead. Okay, so let's tackle the first one. Don't let me forget that second one. <laughs> yeah. Um, so great question, Christine, and I think both of those matter, right? Because I think understanding your capacity kind of tells you, um, again, coming back over here, you know, your capacity relates to what you can earn in a year, right? So this, again, it all works together. So maybe your capacity is 200 pieces a month, but you're not selling nearly that many yet, right? So um, it's good to know kind of a range. And I think there are several ways to tackle this strategically. So let's say, argument's sake, again, these are not right answers. Um, let's say your capacity is 200 pieces a month, but right now you're only selling 50. Okay, so that means your overhead add-on at the lowest would be $17. And if we change it to 50, that brings it up to 67. That gives you kind of a range, right? So, you know, we want to be getting it to the point where you're selling everything you can make. Oops, not 20, 200. Um, we want to get it to the point where your add-on is 17, but right now your add-on would be, you know, 60 or 70. So how do you reconcile that? 
And there are a number of approaches you could take. Um, one of the things I really recommend is that you play with this tool and understand it. But again, logically speaking, your overhead add-on for a pair of um, production line earrings should probably look pretty different than a statement necklace, for example, right? So maybe your statement necklace is at that high end of your overhead add-on and the production earrings are at the low end of your overhead add-on, right? Again, remember, there is no magic number, there is no right answer, but if you understand all your inputs, you can price more strategically and have confidence that it's getting you here. This is your goal, it's your salary, right? That's your goal, it's not the price number, it's your salary. So how are these things working to help you earn your living, okay? So again, play with this, look at the ranges um, uh, and understand how it, it all relates. Um, Kelly, what was the second question? Um, I think that also answered um, Nicola's question, but let me know. Um, so Carol asked, um, do we have a percent embedded for the overhead when you're plugging into the thing, into the, um, the calculation? Is there a percent you have embedded in there? No. So this one, and that's a great question because when we were looking um, at our uh, slides before, the particular example formula I used um, referenced a percent for overhead. Um, now that particular formula, I think it was kind of assigning a percentage of material costs, which is one way that it is often done just to kind of set aside some money for overhead. Um, and different um, pricing formulas sometimes will use percentages instead of just a straight add-on amount. Um, there are a lot of different methods out there. And again, you can debate each of them. In this particular tool, we give you a straight dollar to add on um, to like your, your labor component, your material component, and your overhead component to just kind of add that into the price. So it's a different method. Um, and again, experimenting with a few of these, I think is actually really useful. You know, if you get out there online and look, um, there are several different pricing formulas in the fields that are widely used. Um, play with each of them and see the different results you get for the same piece of jewelry. It's really interesting and it's going to help you get comfortable with that and kind of, you know, feel um, where the best place for you to settle strategically um, and where it makes sense. But what I encourage you to do is, yes, use all those tools, experiment with those tools, experiment with this tool, but never forget where you're trying to get. Um, and that's why this piece is really important. Never forget that it's not about the price tag, it's about your salary at the end of the day. And make sure you're kind of relating it back to this point. Um, and that's where I think this tool adds something that's missing from those formulas, because that's not really a part of the discussion um, with pricing formulas, and I feel like it should be um, at the end of the day. But let's move on to variable costs here, and then I think it's gonna come together and make a little bit more sense, and we'll get to more questions, because I know this is so much to take in. All right, so this next block is your variable cost. So again, if you've got a sample piece of jewelry on your desk, this is a great time to use that um, for your cost inputs. So your components and materials, we just talked about your material variable costs, any outside services, again, casters, platers, stone setters, um, your gift box that you would put this in to give to a customer, and then the number of hours it took you to make it. So this is gonna reference back to the prior sheet in the background, it's doing all the math for you. Um, so based on what your, your production time um, wage was on the prior screen, it's calculating your labor component and saying your variable cost on this item is about $30, okay? So again, you can play with this with the three different pieces of jewelry you have in mind. Um, if you have, you know, maybe this is a pair of earrings, you have a larger necklace that's quite a bit more materials wise. And then obviously your variable cost portion for that piece of jewelry would come up quite a bit. Whoops. Deleting things, that's not good. Okay, so if we scroll down to the bottom, it's in yellow, again, the bottom line, right? Your break-even price. If we consider all of our inputs up here, our overhead costs, our monthly volume, and our variable costs, this would be your break-even price, right? This is covering your labor, it's covering your materials. It is not covering a lot of growth for your business. 
this would be like the minimum piece to minimum price, pardon me, to charge for this particular piece of jewelry um, with these assumptions in place. Now, again, you come back and you change to what you're selling a month and that makes a big adjustment to your final break even price, right? And all of this is kind of interrelated to those salary figures on the prior page. So again, it's kind of bringing in that math. So right here, we're bringing in your administrative salary portion into your overhead calculation. And down below in your variable costs, we're bringing in um, that bench time labor component for your variable costs. And we're baking all of that into a break-even price. Okay, so do this with a few pieces of jewelry that you have in mind in front of you on your desk um, and see how it varies, right? Um, from a pair of earrings to a bracelet to a necklace, um, from a piece that takes very little labor time to a piece that takes a lot of labor time, right? We can play with all of these factors quite a bit and see how that changes the results. So again, this is just a tool. It's not giving you a right answer. It's giving you some things to think about and it's helping you to consider all of these different cost inputs together. And that's really hard to do mentally without tools of some sort, right? Whether they be formulas or, or a tool like this online, um, trying to think about your overhead costs, your variable costs, your, your salary, all of that at once when you're pricing a piece of jewelry, it's really overwhelming and I get that. So, um, if you're if you're overwhelmed by all of this right now i really encourage you to spend some time on your own when you don't have me talking in your ear um, but spend some time when you can really focus on this with some quiet time I have some pieces of jewelry in front of you and again the value in this is to tinker with it play with the numbers and understand how that changes your outcomes okay kelly are we getting some more questions um, so we got a couple, the break even price, people are asking, should that be your wholesale price or your retail price? That's a great question. I'd say that should be your wholesale price, right? I mean, you definitely at least want to be breaking even on your wholesale price. But again, this is also a minimum price. Like this is just covering kind of your costs. Um, if you're considering your labor, um, completely, right? So it's a starting point. And again, there's not a right answer. Um, if you are an experienced person in your field, if you're mid or late career jeweler, you can certainly be adding value here, right? You're delivering more value for your customers. You may have a lot more latitude with your pricing. Um, and again, that comes back to what we were talking about before, where as a master in your field, someone very experienced with a lot of technical expertise, you know, your, your time at the bench becomes more valuable and your administrative time also becomes more valuable. Um, so, you know, make sure you're taking that into account over here on your, on your salary screen, right? Because this is a tool that really should work for you wherever you are in your career, as long as you're really valuing your inputs um, objectively, right? That's the, that's the trick. I really think that's the hardest part. And that's why I think that tool, that payscale.com website is such a valuable resource nowadays because it allows you to do that in an objective way based on the job market, just um, not just on what your mom tells you, <laughs> you know? Um, a lot of times we just hear a number and we go with it because really what other choice did you have? As, you know, especially before these internet tools were so widely available, that was it, you know, you kind of asked around in your network, oh, okay, you're using $25 for bench time, I'm gonna use that too, right? Um, but now there are a lot more tools available for you to benchmark your skill sets and experience levels and fairly value um, the labor in your pieces. So yes, break even price is just that. And notice it doesn't say price, it says break even price, right? This is your starting point um, and it should give you kind of a foundation to think about. Um, okay, another question, um, where do, someone asked, where do consumable, consumables go again, like liver, sulfur, solder, does that go into your components and materials costs? Yes, absolutely, and if you want to separate that out, you know, depending on the techniques you're using in the studio, that can become a major factor. So um, you can definitely kind of right click here and add in a line um, to kind of expand on this tool. Because each of you saved a copy of this, um, 
it's now your file. Like no one else is seeing this. If you want to alter it, you can. If you kind of get into the weeds and you feel like you messed up some of the formulas, you can go back to the link and download a fresh copy. Um, but I encourage you to kind of make this your own. You know, add in different kinds of overhead expenses that may be unique to you and your particular studio and maybe delete some of the others. You know, you can type right over these things um, if you want to change those. Um, the cells to watch out for, do not change the gray ones. <laughs> That's my one big warning. Um, this is the formulas in the background are referencing cells on the salary page and things like that. Um, but you can, you can definitely, um, you know, the blue cells are for your inputs. Those are, those are designed for you to change what's there. Um, and feel free to do so to make this tool work for you. Um, another question, which I think it has probably been answered now, but um, just to clarify with everybody, the, the sheets do work with each other. They talk to each other, how Hillary just said, so um, right. you don't have to connect them. They already come together. Um, and Kimberly asked if she is able to share um, this worksheet with students. Um, Absolutely. I want to say there's yeah. also some blogs we have at the end that Hillary wrote that are in the House Ed blog that talk about this and then link to the the work the spreadsheet so um that would be awesome if you shared that too yep we love it please share um with friends or students anyone is welcome um i see another question on there just glancing over i saw someone asked about cogs cost of goods sold which is a great question um, when we're talking about all of that lingo again getting back to our variable costs and our materials um, cost of goods sold is an accounting term um, for once an item sells, um, the cost um, you assign to that piece of jewelry in your accounting. So it's going to depend a great deal on um, how you're accounting for your work and your labor um, in your accounting system. So um, you can definitely talk to your accountant about that. This is a tool specifically for pricing. It's not designed um, for you to do your cost side accounting. Um, out of this tool specifically. But generally speaking, your, your cost of an item is also, um, you know, it's gonna include your labor, it's going to include your um, variable, your other variable costs, your materials and consumables, but it's not going to include your overhead, okay? So the closest thing to COGS, um, your cost of goods sold would just be like this variable cost portion um, of this pricing page. Um, and that's just to kind of tie together some of these vocabulary terms and concepts that you hear in business a lot. Um, but this tool is much more about the pricing side. I hope that clears that, that question. All right. Um, well, we're definitely have more time for questions later. And like I said, I think this tool, um, you know, really spend some time alone with it uh, when you can concentrate. And I, I think you'll see the value of using it to kind of experiment with different pieces of jewelry, different inputs, um, different ranges on your um, bench time and your administration time um, and see how at the end of the day that all relates back to the salary you can earn with your business. And I think it's really um, great to use this tool to set goals where you want to be and also to look at it now with where you are now. And it's gonna help you identify those gaps to narrow, places to address in your business, places to address in your collection, to develop your, your work and develop your, um, your business label, your branding um, and all of your, your goals to that end. So let's go ahead back to the presentation. I'm really scared I'm gonna close out of this incorrectly. Oh good, it's still there, okay. <laughs> I did this earlier and I like shut down the whole screen sharing, that was not, that was not helpful. Okay, um, so now we're moving out of the tool and back to just the presentation and some other concepts I want to leave you with before um, we kind of wrap up and move on to the discussion phase. So part of the pricing discussion also needs to be your collection of jewelry as a portfolio of different price points. And this is something that we really try to encourage um, early career jewelry artists to consider in particular because you get a lot of advice, right? Um, we get a lot of advice, um, pardon me, that jewelers undervalue their work, um, which is true, but there's a lot of things to consider. And I, I feel like, um, you know, early career artists, especially you're, you're receiving so much advice that you don't wanna underprice your work, but you also still need to compete and you need to sell items. 
um, and it, it makes your head spin, right? So I think it's important to remember that your collection should show a range of price points. And there are several reasons for that. You wanna show diversity in your pricing strategy to hit a few different goals within your business. So it's really important to have entry level price point items. These are usually like your earrings or maybe some really simple rings, um, basic, basic pieces. Um, these may not be the ones you're most excited to make. Um, they may not be the ones that kind of make your heart flutter, um, but it's important to kind of have an entry point for customers um, because if you think about this again from the consumer perspective, if someone is walking into your store like Brooks Amazing Gallery here in Santa Fe, or if someone is walking into your booth, they may be very drawn to your aesthetic. They may be very drawn to the statement necklace right there grabbing your attention when you walk in the door. Um, but they may not be able to afford it, or they may have just bought something that morning, and it may just not be in the budget. But if they're drawn to your aesthetic by those headliner pieces, they're going to look around for what's in their budget that day. And it's important to have an entry access point to get them established as a relationship with your brand, as a relationship with your jewelry um, to know you. And then hopefully you're going to build repeat transactions and business with that customer and increase the relationship with them over time. Now, I also really encourage jewelers, even if you're making mind-blowing conceptual work, to also have this in the design sense, because sometimes people are really drawn to your extremely narrative conceptual work, but they don't have the courage to actually wear it and buy it. And this is a big issue in jewelry, especially for a lot of jewelers coming um, from the, the art side of thing, where you have this amazing technical experience and this amazing narrative work. And then if you're trying to bring it to market, this can become a tremendous barrier, right? Not just the price points, but also um, connecting with a number of buyers who are ready to buy and wear that kind of work. So sometimes having some more basic pieces in your collection that are maybe a little bit more familiar is gonna help them kind of in that buying process to work up to your higher price points and more complex pieces. So, you know, whatever you identify that entry point to be, make sure you're kind of covering that base a little bit. Um, then the mid-level, the main body of your collection should be reflective of your work, right? This is your bread and butter. It should show your core techniques, the skills you've mastered, your aesthetic, your message, all of those things that make you passionate about being a jeweler. Um, that should really be the main body of your collection where you see your average range of price points. Um, but then I also think it's very important for artists to have aspirational pieces in the collection and maybe not many, but these become like your headliner pieces, right? These are the ones that you use for your PR to maybe get published, maybe get in an article or a gift guide. They're very visual, they're attention grabbing, um, they're over the top, they're your statement pieces. And these are the pieces that draw people in the door and draw people to your booth. Um, you may not sell many of them, they may be a lot more expensive, but having those headliner pieces as part of your diversification strategy is equally important to having these other price points in the collection. So um, we see a lot of early career jewelers really hitting kind of a narrow range of price points right out of the gates. Um, and we encourage you to kind of widen out your, your portfolio a little bit. Now, the overall range, again, is going to depend very much on your techniques and materials, right? So your entry level price point for copper jewelry is going to look very different than an entry level price point for a gold collection. But the, the main idea is to kind of see a spread and a diversification across your collection. Um, and then, you know, the particulars of that are going to depend on your, your materials and your, your specific audience. Um, and then, of course, your, of course, your custom work also comes into play here as well. Um, and you should be able to charge a premium for custom if that's a service you're offering to your clientele. Lost my mouse. Okay. All right. So this is a fun little marketing graphic um, that I think illustrates some important concepts about diversifying your collection and your price points. So we've all heard the term cash cow, right? What's the cash cow in your business? Um, and cash cows, if we look at this grid, we're talking about kind of a range of, of cash generation 
um, and cash usage and growth potential, right? So this is kind of a, a marketing reference tool that's used in the business world a lot. So your cash cows are products in your collection that don't require a lot of inventory investment, but they generate a lot of cash, right? So these aren't like growing, new, innovative, crazy over the top items. These are probably your basics, um, the best selling items in your collection that are probably lower price points, but you turn them over a lot. So, um, you know, if you go to a show and you always know you're gonna sell like 10 pairs of this one really popular earring, that's probably your cash cow. It's not the highest priced piece in your collection, but if you look at um, how that design generates cash for your business over time, it probably generates a lot more than you realize. Um, and those are your cash cow items, right? They don't tie up a lot of inventory costs, but they generate a lot of money for your business. Okay, your stars are up here and they require more cash, more materials, but they're commanding higher prices. And these are the ones that kind of um, get your heart a flutter like we were talking about earlier, right? This is hitting all of your passion buttons. It's the work you're really excited to make. Um, it commands higher prices. It generates more attention to your business and your presence. So it's the really exciting stuff. Um, and these are wonderful to have, but you want to diversify your stars and your cash cows. You want to have some of both. You can't be too dependent on either one. So again, it's always important to kind of hit all these different points in your strategy. Now over here, we have kind of some of our problem children. And this, this is a dog. It looks a little bit like a fox, but it also looks a lot like our graphic designer's dog named Coda, who is in the office most days. So this is Coda. Coda is a dog. <laughs> we usually speak about Coda with great affection, but in this particular graphic, it's dogs in the bad sense, right? So your dogs, um, they may not use much cash and inventory and materials, but they also don't make you any money. So these are the inventory pieces. This is the item in your case that you made eight years ago, and it is still in your case. <laughs> um, and that's a sad reality in the jewelry world too, right? Your dogs, they just don't sell. So maybe you didn't tie up a lot of money, but you just can't get rid of it either. So you don't want many of those, obviously. That's kind of the no brainer. You wanna get rid of your dogs. Now what's interesting is you're always gonna have some of these question marks and your question marks, ooh, pardon me, there we go. Your question marks are items that maybe you invested a lot of time and in inventory materials into because you think there's a lot of potential there. So this is like your new collections. You're investing time and materials here. You put a lot into them, but you haven't got a lot out of them yet. So they're a little bit untested. Um, and it's really important to have question marks in your mix too, right? Because over time, your stars in your cash cows, they may not be your stars in your cash cows anymore. So you always need to be taking some risks as well, right? So your question marks, even though they feel a little bit scary, they're a really important part of diversifying your collection, your price points, and your aesthetic, right? To kind of keep pushing that envelope and also moving with the times. Um, you know, the jewelry world, it moves fast. So um, innovation is pretty important. And a final thought to leave you guys with on price, especially for those of you who are early career artists, um, don't try and compete on price. And I think that's one of the places where the formulas may really lead you astray um, because it, it kind of, um, I don't know, it encourages that mindset that, oh, if I just lower my markup, if I just lower my markup, I'll price lower and I'm going to sell more um, and that's going to help me grow my business. Um, and that's a little bit of a trap. So be really careful um, with that temptation. So try not to compete on price. It's not a great business strategy in the jewelry field in general. Um, you know, if your cuff bracelet is $120 and the one next to you is $135, it's pretty unlikely that they're identical and that $15 price difference is going to make or break the sale. So don't get too hung up on that. And again, that's just one more reason not to obsess about getting that right number on the price tag quite so much. Instead of focusing on the number, focus on creating value, focus on creating really great work and connecting with your customers and communicating your message to them. 
that's what's going to deliver value way more than the specific number, especially if you're sweating those dollars and those very small differences. And branding becomes a big part of delivering that value, right? As you build your reputation as a jeweler, as people recognize your work and your name, that adds value. And again, that gives you more latitude in how you cost in your labor for both your bench time and your um, administration and design time. And the latitude that you have around those break-even prices we talked about before. So again, you know, remember, that point of comparison, those blue jeans, right? You have this latitude around those numbers. So at the end of the day, you should be delivering value, very high quality work, a memorable service experience, branded packaging, and on-point communications that tell your customers you understand them and that they connect with you. Um, that's what part of the pricing conversation should really be about. And don't let these voices in the back of your mind dictate your pricing because really they probably weren't your buyers to begin with. Okay. So using all of these tools, using formulas and the terms that I hope you understand better now, um, using the interactive tool that we provided you with today, I hope that'll help you to kind of find your sweet spot and really identify the price you're willing to accept and where that intersects with the price your customers are willing to pay. At the end of the day, the final number on the price tag is up to you and nobody's going to question your math or your formula. So understand your costs, understand your goals. And from there, it's really up to you. So some other tools we want to offer for you guys today. Um, again, this is clickable for those of you um, who have hyperlinks enabled right now on your browser. Um, you can click on this article. This was a wonderful piece that Michael David Sterling um, did for us a few years ago. And then on the next slide, this is another piece um, that I wrote a few years back that also has a link to the interactive tool we just used. Um, this is an article in our blog on pricing. I really encourage you to visit our blog um, and subscribe. We have a lot of business content for you there um, on topics like pricing, photography, marketing, branding, accounting, some of the cash flow concepts we touched on here. Um, it's a tremendous resource for entrepreneurs in the jewelry field, so I encourage you to explore the content there and subscribe to the Halstead blog. And I want to remind everyone too, especially for those of you who are emerging artists, um, we are calling for entries for the Halstead grant again this year. The deadline is August 1st. This is an award that's open to jewelers who started their business within the last five years and who are working in silver. Um, this year, we're really honored to be working with Sarah Rachel Brown as our guest juror for the competition. Um, we encourage you to click right here on the slide um, to download an application for the Halstead Grant. If you are not an emerging artist, it's still a tremendous resource to download the application because it really walks you through a lot of goal setting exercises for your business and kind of um, outlines the basics of a business plan to help you establish a growth strategy for your jewelry studio business. All right, and I think that brings us to the end. So Kelly, do we have some other questions that have been queuing up? Anything we should explore a little bit more? Yeah, um, so somebody asked, I know when you're new, you're experimenting with pricing and maybe you did underprice your work and now you're nervous to raise your prices because you sold that piece to somebody for this amount and you're nervous to change. What is um, your advice for when you're going to either raise or lower your prices, what's the best way to do it? Just don't put it off. I mean, really, I still get that. I've been doing this for 20 years and price increases still stress me out. So I completely understand how you feel. Um, there's always just this terror that, oh my gosh, if I raise prices, business is going to drop dead tomorrow. <laughs> um, and it, like I said, I've been in my career for so long and it still makes me lose sleep at night, but I can also tell you it has never happened. <laughs> And I should know better, <laughs> but I still get worried. Um, and I always put it off too long. Um, you know, you see your costs rising and you're keeping your, your price in the same place. Um, and it's, it's making it harder and harder to run your business and to earn your living at the end of the day. Again, um, you have to be responsive to those cost changes. And what I really encourage you to do is start increasing or 
addressing your, your prices on a really regular basis. So I think, um, you know, all of us put it off too long because we do have that fear factor. But if you put yourself on kind of a regular schedule of, I need to reprice my work, you know, every year, late summer, after shows, before holiday, I need to address pricing and keep it up to date. Um, then it becomes routine and it's a little bit less scary. If you're only doing it once, it's got to that kind of critical point every five years, um, then the price increases are gonna be bigger. Um, so that's more stressful for both you and your customers. So it's better to just kind of do it on a regular basis over time. Um, but you know, if you are to that point where you need a major price increase, at the end of the day, you just gotta do it. Um, and um, it's, it's probably not gonna impact your business the way you expect. So take the plunge and, and do what you need to do to, to make sure you're meeting those goals. Hmm. What else do we have? The only other one was asking about European designers versus American, um, that sometimes American pricing seems higher. Do you have any comments on that? You know, I am not intimately involved in the European market, so I really can't speak to that as much. We do have a lot of clients over there, um, and it is a really different marketplace than the U.S. in several ways, um, not just price points. So, um, I'm sorry, I can't speak to that. Patricia, do you have any feedback on that point on the international market? I think that's a great question. Uh, um, you know, I'm putting I, you on the spot, sorry. No, that's okay, that's okay. I was, I was typing something into the chat because I'm like, oh my God, everything Hillary is saying is amazing and I can totally verify it from personal experience and my own business that I've had for over 30 years. Um, so, so could you repeat the question? <laughs> well, we had a question I couldn't answer. So I was wondering if you could offer any insights. Um, the international market, like pricing for international yeah. market. That on average, American jewelry prices seem to be higher than European jewelry prices and, and why that is. You know, I, I'm not, I'm not going to, I don't know if I can agree with that actually, personally. Um, I think, I think it depends what I mean, this is just my personal opinion. I think it depends what market you're looking at, you know, yeah. and how is it manufactured? Was it manuf Was it an artist making it, a designer, a studio artist, or was it manufactured? Mm -hmm. So I, I think that plays a big role in, in how we might view those prices and how we might make those comparisons. But I think if you're looking at maybe the studio artist market, you, I don't think you see that much um, difference mm -hmm. personally. Yeah, that's a great point. There are so many variables. And I think that's, again, why this is such a tough topic. You know, just think about everything we've talked about in the last hour and a half. There are so many things to consider going into pricing. That's why it's so hard. Um, and any one of those variables can make a tremendous impact on, on where the pricing lands. Absolutely. <clears throat> All right, anything else we should kind of talk about a little bit more? to see on here. You know, may, may I also just maybe address that international question again, because I'm reading it here now. And okay, great. I also, I also want to say that I, I do think that, like, for example, this amazing workshop that you've just presented to us, Hillary, you've really talked about very solid ways to think about pricing. And I don't think that this also happens everywhere else. I, I, do, I don't think that the you know, that, um, that whether it's an artist or a commercial maker will, will, you know, looks at pricing in this way. And that could also be um, maybe explaining some of the differences. Mm -hmm. Again, just my opinion. Yeah, I would agree with that. I mean, I, I've been in this field a very long time and, you know, on both ends of the spectrum, I see work that I think is tremendously overpriced and selling very, very well. <laughs> And then I'll see work that I think is incredibly underpriced and not selling the way it should be. Um, and there are just so many factors involved. And that's why I think it's really important to kind of bring in that, that branding component or reputation, however you want to think about it. Um, as a jewelry artist, um, that's a really big part of the equation with pricing. If you think about some of the biggest names in the industry, the Todd Reeves and the Alex Sepkis and the work that is really highly recognizable, um, as metalsmiths, when you look at their work, 
you can see the premiums they're able to command because of those reputations. Um, and again, that's delivering value to those customers. The reputation, the recognizable work, um, all of those things are factors that deliver value. Um, so it's much more than just um, the intrinsic value of materials, the labor time, that also comes to bear on what work can command in the market. Um, and on that same note, we didn't talk a lot about competitive comparisons, but I do think it's important in the field to kind of be keeping tabs on what's happening in the market around you. Um, you know, if you're selling a silver bracelet, um, you need to at least know kind of what the boundaries are on what you can price, um, both the high and the low point, just to get a range. Again, it's one more thing to kind of consider and make sure you're in that, um, that same consideration set. All right. Kelly, there's so many comments on here. I can't even. Yeah, here, I have some questions <laughs> for you. Um, Karen, I'm going to copy a link about how to target customers successfully to you. Um, another question was, um, do you have an average cost for standard premium um, product packaging? Like what would be a normal cost for a company's spend. That's I know it can be all over the place too. It can be all over the place. I've seen, you know, for premium packaging, I've seen packaging going all the way up to like 50 to $70 a box. I mean, it's, it gets really up there. So there is a tremendous range in packaging costs. Um, you know, the little paper boxes you can get for, you know, 25 cents a piece, all the way up to leather and wooden boxes um, that are really almost like custom display. So, um, I think packaging is a really cool opportunity for branding um, and it does it does enhance the value of your work, the perceived value of your work in a lot of cases. So especially if you're working in the high end segment in higher end materials, I think investing in really premium packaging is a smart business decision a lot of times. And again, that that should get priced into your work. It's one of your variable costs. So don't be pricing the jewelry and then putting it in the $50 box. That $50 box needs to be priced along with the jewelry. And it is part of the value you're delivering to your customer. It's part of the customer experience. So again, it's one of those things you just gotta kind of change your mindset a little bit about it. It is a variable cost, so make sure it's priced in. Um, and then you know, select the packaging that makes the most sense um, with your branding and with the work you're making. Yeah, I think a lot of people have questions about either holding a sale and dropping the price or if they've made this big custom piece and it sat around for a while, um, lowering the price on it. Um, and just a comment that I have you know, lived through and also um, Kristen made a good point about it. Sometimes lowering the price or underpricing your work can also lead to it not selling. So there's the, the opposite effect. Um, yeah. And for those of you who don't know Kelly, Kelly is our managing and creative manager. Um, I'm going to kind of kick this question back to her because Kelly is a metalsmith and she also ran a retail gallery um, with her own work and the work of other jewelry artists. So she has a lot of experience on this too. Um, so Kelly, speak to that a little bit more about how to handle liquidation and clearance. I think that's a great question. Yeah. Well, it can be a double-edged sword. I mean, if you've been sitting on pieces for a while and you want to do a flash sale, um, you definitely can. But I always think if you just want to entice people to buy your work, maybe offering a um, small gift with per purchase or free shipping instead of lowering the retail of your piece, then it doesn't lower the value of your piece, uh, offering free shipping or offering um, a gift with purchase. I think that's a better way to go a lot of the times. Um, and how Hillary said earlier, the $120 cuff sitting next to the $135 cuff um, or $150 cuff, some people perceive $120 as it wasn't made as well. It's not as nice and they will buy the more expensive one. Um, so really, I mean, you need to price your work what you, you know, with all these calculations, what you really think it's worth. And I think, um, you know, getting your branding and the customer service and everything else behind it and just, you know, sticking to your guns and this is what my work is worth, I think is, is the best way to go. Yeah, those, are, those are great points. Yeah, Patricia. Oh, I, I, I just wanted to share another real, real world experience, uh, personal experience. And I totally agree with what Kelly's saying. 
Um, you know, I, I've had very expensive pieces. I, I do exactly what you recommend, a range. I have a huge price range in my collection and in my work. And some pieces are very, very expensive and they take, a, some of them sell really quickly. It's always a mystery, but I've had pieces that I've had for a while and I've never changed the price. And somehow eventually the right customer finds that piece and buys it. <laughs> And I've had this happen over so many years that it, it, it always amazes me, mm -hmm. but I've, I, I relied on that. I, I've never reduced my prices. And I think Kelly's absolutely right about that. And I, I also wanted to share that um, on this very topic, uh, Marlene Ritchie in her book, uh, is it Pricing by Design? Yes, it's That's a great a book. really great, great, I'm not going to share it, but if anyone wants to check it out, you could you can read in the book. She has this great um, uh, anecdotal story about this very, very, very t topic that is amazing. And I read it and I was like, that makes so much sense to me. <laughs> it's, I, about not, it's, about, it's about exactly what Kelly was saying. Like, if you lower the price, sometimes it makes your work seem questionable. Yeah. It's true. It's true. And I've, I've heard that same story. Sometimes when a piece isn't selling well, if you really increase the price, then all of a sudden it'll move. Um, so again, a lot of this is trial and error and experimentation. So don't be afraid to do that. Um, now, just to play devil's advocate, I, I fully appreciate what Kelly and Patricia have just been talking about, but there, there are also real risks to your business and tying up a lot of money in inventory. Um, and if you're finding that you're holding a lot of inventory that isn't moving, um, and you're having difficulty paying bills, that's because a lot of your cash has gotten kind of tied up in inventory and materials. Um, so it, like all things, you know, balance is really important. Moderation is key to kind of try and be producing work at roughly the same rate it's selling um, and not getting yourself too inventory heavy where you end up very, very cash strapped. Um, so Mariel Diaz did a wonderful um, article for us on the Halstead blog, you can search um, on cash flow and some of the inventory traps you can get into. Um, sometimes at a certain point, you do have to run some clearance and liquidation just to, to free up some cash again. Um, so, you know, at the end of the day, you got to keep your business going. So if that's necessary, don't beat yourself up about it. Sometimes um, we all have those pieces. Um, my dad used to call them coffin beads like back in the old days because he said he was going to be buried with them. <laughs> Because he would go buy these crazy things every once in a while just to take a risk. And, you know, you do need to take risks in your business. And some, sometimes they're going to flop. And that's okay. That's part of entrepreneurship. So don't, you, don't beat yourself up about it too much. Um, but that's also all the more reason, kind of circling back to the pricing tool, um, you do need to um, price in some, some business growth into your work, right? Because you are always going to have some pieces that don't sell at all. So if you're pricing all of your work at just this very break even, bare bones, low price tag, and you're not allowing any buffer for some of those maybe product failures or unexpected expenses, like when this studio um, water main breaks and floods and you have to do those repairs, you know, a little bit of um, cushion is really important to, to consider in pricing into your work as well. Um, so kind of try and think about that strategically from the get-go so you have a little bit of wiggle room too. Um, um, Kelly? I have a few more questions. Um, someone's talking about how stone prices have increased dramatically recently. Um, so would you suggest increasing their prices or what do you, what do you have to say about that? Yeah, absolutely. I mean, move with the market. And I think, again, get in the habit of adjusting prices pretty frequently so that they you know, hopefully don't have to be big price jumps too often. But even the big price jumps, customers will often understand, you know, especially when, um, you know, if a customer notices you explain, you know, I really apologize. We've seen a major increase in gemstone prices in the last six months and we had to respond. Um, and it's pretty rare that the conversation turns to negative beyond that point once customers understand the reason for things. Um, but you also, again, you have to be pricing to meet those goals for your salary and to make a living. So if you're selling your work short um, and not getting to those, um, you know, salary goals, then that's, that's sacrificing too much. So, you know, respond as quickly as you can. Keep 
people are asking about um, credit card charges, um, where would they factor that, that in? Um, yeah, and that's tricky. I mean, there's an argument for putting it in overhead, but I would say it should go in variable costs because usually those merchant services fees are a percentage of the total transaction. Um, so that's a great thought. That's something you can definitely price into the variable cost section um, of your you know, formula or the interactive tool um, to add in um, whatever your rate is, you know, an additional 3% um, plus a dollar transaction fee or however it is your particular merchant service provider is charging. Um, but that's definitely a variable cost input and it should be considered as part of the selling price of your work. One more here. Um, do you have any thoughts about, you know, your online store having these, you know, retail prices, but then when you sell at a show or in person or out of your studio, um, pricing differently? I think you have to be really careful if you're selling wholesale, especially um, as a, as a jewelry artist, it is really important to respect your wholesale relationships and protect those. Um, so that's the first thing I would say is never undersell your wholesale accounts um, in a way that you would be competing with them. That's the quickest way to spoil a relationship um, and really lose an account in the wholesale world. So um, that being said, um, you know, when we used to do a lot of trade shows too, that's one of the best places to deal with clearance inventory that we were just talking about, right? You know, you don't have to put it up for sale on your website, but maybe you have the sales section at a special event or a trade show um, that can draw people into your booth and help you get rid of some inventory that maybe hasn't been moving or hasn't done well. Um, and I think that's a great opportunity to kind of do that in a limited space um, without diluting or damaging your larger brand, um, like Patricia and Kelly were talking about earlier. So I think it can be a very strategically smart thing to do, um, but um, I would encourage you to really kind of have it off to the side, um, make sure it's separated from the main body of your work and that you're not kind of presenting your entire brand um, as a discounted label. Um, you just wanna kind of show this as last season's work or whatever you wanna call it. Um, but yeah, I mean, absolutely. It's, it's a strategy um, that, that works, can help you with your inventory management, but just make sure you're, you're considering um, all of the stakeholders in your business and how they might be impacted. Um, we have a question, just uh, what are your tips on finding new wholesale accounts? Oh gosh, that's a whole nother seminar. <laughs> Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> there are so many tips and we have, um, we have some great articles on the Halstead blog about that as well. Um, Robin Kramer contributed on that topic and we also have some insights from Martha Levan who runs Mora Gallery in um, Asheville, North Carolina on how to kind of approach accounts for wholesale. There are a lot of different ways to go. Um, and you know, like I, I talked about earlier, even if you aren't strategically planning to pursue wholesale accounts right now, I really urge you to um, kind of consider that in your, in your pricing strategy and calculations, um, just so you don't get boxed into a quarter later. Um, but one of the first things your wholesale prospects are gonna ask you is um, what kind of markup room there is between your wholesale price and the retail price you're selling on your own website or through other channels. And if you can't show that there is room for them to profitably stock and sell your work, you will never get the account. So pricing is a really important thing to consider when you're looking at pursuing wholesale prospects. Um, and you really wanna make sure, you know, that cushion, that buffer we talked about between your wholesale and your retail price, make sure it's there and make sure it's enough for them to, to make money on their own business with all of their different cost inputs. Um, they have all the same things you do. So um, they, they need to earn a living too. Um, Emily had a question about tips on selling in bulk orders. I'm guessing this is for not wholesale. I'm guessing if maybe a retail person wanted to order um, a large quantity of a single item, would you give a discount for that or suggest that? Yeah, I mean, I think um, that's a common question, right? If I, you know, if I buy two or if I buy, buy a set for all my bridesmaids, um, can I get a discount? Certainly a fair question. Um, it depends very much on your work and how much room you have in your pricing. Um, but um, what I can tell you is a lot of times it doesn't have to be a huge discount. Um, people want to see some give and take if they're looking to negotiate. 
and sometimes offering a discount of even like 5% um, is, is helpful and kind of pushes them towards the sale. Um, so don't assume they're expecting to get like 50% off or something massive. Sometimes you can offer a very small incentive um, and that's enough to kind of satisfy them, um, help them feel like they walked away with a win <laughs> and kind of close the sale. Um, so yeah, I would encourage you not to just reject it outright, kind of see if you can meet in the middle. And sometimes offering other benefits is a great solution too. Like if you don't have room in your pricing um, to discount for whatever reason, um, you may be able to, to offer a free gift with purchase or something like Kelly said, you know, oh, you know, I, I don't really have a lot of room on these necklaces, but, um, you know, if you also buy these matching bracelets, I have a lot of room on these and here's maybe where we could work something out. Um, so approach it creatively instead of rejecting it outright. And I think you'll do pretty well. Um, so, so Kelly, do you want me to ask the question or do you want to ask well, it? I think you should ask it because I'm not okay. entirely sure. Okay. So, <laughs> I don't so, so Hillary, I just, I was going to ask you about like if, and I, and this could be going into the weeds, but like the, like tax ramifications, right? So we, you know, a lot of our materials, our raw materials, our studio expenses, et cetera, are, are tax deductible. Mm -hmm. So how does that factor into these formulas? Ooh, that is, that's getting pretty complicated. That is, so, okay. That's, that's yeah. <laughs> <laughs> um, I think, so taxes, I mean, are you talking about sales tax? Um, no, I was talking more about income tax and, income tax, and how, yeah. you know, like, you know, you can, you can deduct some of these things when you are, uh, you know, as a business, as a registered right. business, obviously, um, but that's fine. I know that does get really we into the weeds. So no, no but I, I do think it's an important point. And um, yeah, I mean, certainly as you're more established in your career and you're, you're a profitable business, right? And hopefully you're, you're moving beyond just um, income tax on your income and maybe moving to taxable income for the business, which is wonderful as you become established. Um, it can be quite a surprise <laughs> and it can definitely take you off guard when your accountant comes back with your, your in tax filing and says, oh, and by the way, you owe an extra $5,000 in taxes. It's horrifying. <laughs> um, so it is a really important point, um, but I would encourage you not to kind of price in income tax um, at such a granular level as, um, you know, the pricing for individual pieces of jewelry. Um, that's pretty tough because there are so many factors that contribute to that overall profitability during the year. Um, and there are other strategies you can work on with your accountant um, outside of the pricing of your collection to kind of handle tax issues. Um, so I don't really advise, um, you know, adding a variable cost or an overhead cost line um, for um, business taxes, um, but it is something to kind of talk to your accountant about um, and try to, to kind of understand and be prepared for um, as your business grows. It's, it's a great point. And Kristen just said that she'll be doing a craft lab on taxes in December. Oh, great. Oh, she just posted the link to it. Awesome. That's fantastic. All right. I I, I'm so happy Kristen is, is here with us. <laughs> Yay, me too. <laughs> All right, Patricia, do you have any great. final final thoughts or questions before we wrap it up? We've got just a few minutes left, right? I feel like I have a thousand questions, a but thousand. I'm not going to ask them. <laughs> <laughs> well, I, I hope I didn't add confusion. Um, oh, it's a lot to think about. And um, if you're feeling overwhelmed, you're not alone. I mean, just looking at the enrollment for this webinar, I think is a, a good indication of how difficult this issue really is in the field. Um, so, you know, don't, don't be too hard on yourself. <laughs> uh, you know, I just want to say, Hillary, this is an amazing presentation. I've learned so much and I've been doing this a long time. Um, but I also think that it is so incredibly valuable and the way you presented it was exceptional, truly. Oh, and I, I think I'm, um, you know, uh, 
reinforcing everything that people were posting in the chat. You know, this is the, the best webinar and pricing is really hard and you've made it so um, accessible and attainable and, and a little easier to understand for all of us, even though it is complex. Mm -hmm. um, thank you so much, truly. Wow. And, and I want to just also say a big thank you to Kelly and mm -hmm. um, to Linda for, for being here, helping us out to Indiana, um, uh, the university, Indiana University for allowing us to use their um, Zoom link, their Zoom platform, because we had so many uh, registrants and, and Hillary, really just outstanding. Thank you. Uh, thanks, Patricia. It was fantastic to be here. I really appreciate all of the really thoughtful questions um, for the, from the participants too. Um, and feel free to, you know, keep sending those along. We're gonna, um, you know, email all of you to, to get your feedback and suggestions. Um, and if you have additional questions on the interactive tool, that last tab was an FAQ page um, that addresses some of the things you've brought up today. And we're definitely gonna be building on that after the presentation to kind of fill in some blanks and address some of the issues that you guys brought up, which were really great points to consider and add to the discussion. Um, so um, yes, echoing everything Patricia just said, thanks to Indiana State University. Thank you to Patricia and Snag and Kelly for all the great work on the team today. And um, thanks to all of you for being here with us yes. on the webinar. Um, I really enjoyed the last couple of hours um, and I wish you so much luck with pricing and your jewelry studio businesses at whatever phase they may be in. And I hope to see you at another SNAG event very soon. Oh, thank you, Hillary. Thanks everyone for joining us. Really appreciate it. And hope that you have a, a great remainder of the week. <laughs> All right, you too. Take care. All right, thanks. Bye.